но большинство из них мы просто пробежимся. Это просто будут у нас воспоминания о том, что мы уже знаем. Даже если вы этого не знаете, греки говорили, что любое знание в нас заложено. Это в любом случае будет воспоминание о том, что мы не знаем. Так. И, пожалуйста, если есть вопросы, давайте сразу останавливаться и задавать. Самое главное – нам пообщаться. Самое главное – Поскольку я не вижу вас, то хотя бы хочу вас очень услышать. Ваши вопросы любые задавайте, будет очень здорово. Ой, вижу, что уже в чате кто-то пишет. Да. А, окей. So, um, oh, problem is I didn't know that I, I, I downloaded only the Russian version of the presentation. Should I change it into the English one, or it will be fine if I will just speak in English? Yeah, yeah. I... Oh. Because I modified it a little bit. I don't have originals in English, but the, this one I I use the Russian translation. I think uh, if you will send. Other questions? Maybe I'll start with some general introductory words about myself. Or what do you think? Yeah, it's a great idea. Okay, my name is Vladimir Trifonov. I am from Novosibirsk, uh, from the Institute of Molecular and Cellular Biology. And I congratulate all the students that you selected this topic, biology and bioinformatics. It's really interesting and I enjoy every day uh, everything I'm working on. So I hope you will also enjoy it. And this is the main thing so that we can not only perceive the reality, but we should also try to get as much as we can and uh, with pleasure. Okay, um, several words probably about myself. So I did my uh, university degree uh, at Novosibirsk State University. Uh, then I, uh, I've got a DAD scholarship. So I went to Germany and worked for a year. I was already a PG student. So I went to Germany to, um, to the University of um, Jena. Uh, and I worked there uh, at the medical unit at, at hospital. So I, I was doing medical genetics mostly, uh, uh, cytogenetics and analysis of chromosomal rearrangements. And then I moved back to Novosibirsk and I defended my PhD. And in three weeks after defense, I went to guess which country. You will never guess. Uh, it was South Africa. So I went to South Africa because it was a very interesting project about hybridization, interspecific hybridization between two species of rhinoceros. Because as you know, in Africa, there are two species, the black rhino and the white rhino. The colors, it's totally bullshit. So don't, don't think about colors. The main thing that these are two different species separated around. Uh, 14 million years ago, and um, it was claimed that they found a hybrid between those. And it was really interesting to check if it's a really hybrid or it's just an unusual calf similar to that. So I went there and we did uh, genetic analysis and confirmed that it was really a hybrid, which means that uh, in captivity, most animals, even separated um, evolutionary, can produce hybrids. Uh, and I didn't, I didn't stay long in South Africa just for half a year. 
and then I moved back to Russia and I had many projects with Germany. So I went to Germany every, almost every two years, every one, two years. And then I did my postdoc in the UK, in the University of Cambridge, where I also was involved in comparative cytogenetic and cytogenomic studies of different mammals. And the main topic was their sex chromosome evolution. Um, and I also did my topic on, on B chromosomes and the expression and genes located on them. And after, after I completed my postdoc, I went back to Novosibirsk where I continued my career there. Okay, I think we can already start, right? right. Yes, we are ready. Okay, maybe, maybe you have some questions about anything before we start. Uh, I don't like this noise my computer is producing. I hope everything's fine. Okay, uh, so today our topic is uh, connected to eukaryote genome complexities. Complexity. So eukaryote genomes are very complex and they contain many sequences which look abundant. So they, they are not nece necessary needed for organism and survival. Uh, they are not necessary, or there is another word for this. Uh, let, me, let me think about, very, very nice word in English. Um, okay, uh, anyway, like it's some sort of redundancy which we can always uh, observe and we will talk about this redundancy, its reasons and how it complicates our work when we analyze genome and on the other hand, uh, what are the reasons behind and uh, what are advantages of having some abundant parts uh, in our genome. Uh, anyway, let's first um, think about uh, why. Uh, why uh, generally evolution is uh, always moving towards more and more complexity uh, and more and more sophisticated forms are produced. Why not to stay on the same place and uh, to have the same, approximately the same level of uh, organization and complexity? What do you think? Why everything is getting more and more complex? Because our phenotype is getting more and more complex. Mm -hmm. Uh, but so, probably phenotype is a consequence of complexity of genome, so the direction is opposite. <laughs> yeah. but, but, but there is uh, uh, evolution and it is like um, the cycle. We have a evolution uh, and uh, our phenotype uh, influenced for who are to survive. Yeah, I, I think so. Uh, probably uh, it is because uh, the always changing um, some conditions. Yes, which... very good. Uh, yes. Yeah. Yes. Environment. Yes, let's think about parasites, right? When everything is uh, available, all the resources are around, nothing changes. Uh, the only ten tendency we have is reduction, reduction of genome and reduction of complexity. When the environmental is changing, um, the, there is a need for organisms to get more and more complex because we don't know what to expect from the environment. That's why anything, uh, any additional part we've got, if we can retain it, it might be useful in future. We don't know yet if it will be or not. But anyway, if we have something, we may, uh, it may become a very important advantage and we can survive because of that. So this is maybe some evolutionary considerations about it. But when we talk about eukaryotic organisms, which as we know are much more complex than prokaryotic, you probably all read the book of uh, Kunin, uh, The Logic of Chance. And um, 
which was very important in eukaryogenesis. We don't talk here about eukaryogenesis generally, but we remember that uh, at this time, uh, the genome became very large. And um, first of all, because, um, because of mitotic and meiotic divisions, because it was also well regulated, um, we didn't need uh, to, uh, there, there was no um, restriction for genome size. And as soon as this res restriction was removed, because of organized cell division, because of mitosis, as soon as it was removed, the genome started to grow and uh, to grow very fast, as we see. Uh, and uh, the second reason behind, which is also evolutionary, is the population size. Uh, if our population is huge, then the evolution is not so fast. Um, and the purifying selection doesn't work so well, which will purify all these unnecessary things. But when the population is very small, uh, all these genomic, let's call them par parasites, or anything, anything additional, any redundancy, it will be retained because, because the population is so small. So these two uh, reasons why the genome started to um, to grow and um, to deal with it, uh, organisms started to develop different um, technologies, such as uh, epi epigenetic silencing of redundant DNA, uh, diminution of chromatin. We will talk about this later. But the main thing is that suddenly it was a new law that everything possible. You can, uh, because eukaryotic cell is just like a very, very rich person. It's enough money to buy everything. It's enough money to buy a huge genome and retain it. Um, we are not um, think about, we don't think about that we have to be economical with our genome and reduce it as other, as prokaryotic organisms do, because we invented mitosis, organized cell division. And as we see the levels of uh, genome complexity are also different of genome redundancy, sorry, uh, because um, we will talk a little bit, not, not very much, because Olga Podgorner will uh, give a big lecture about this. I will just mention several uh, important topics just to, to keep in mind, and we will move uh, towards other, other levels. So it's uh, repetitive uh, DNA sequences. Um, it's uh, amplified genes and something we call um, segmental duplications. I, I, will, I will give um, a definition for this later. Uh, besides, we can observe um, appearance of additional chromosomes, uh, which are not very common, but nevertheless, it's very important level of uh, genome redundancy when the autonomous chromosome may exist pretty big and it may have uh, genes and um, some other important elements, structural elements of the genome. And of course, uh, when we can allow this uh, redundancy, we can multiply the whole genome. And it's also a very important trend of evolution. When we deal with our uh, normal objects, like with human or with mice or with many uh, drosophila, we don't see much about polyploidy, but actually it's a pretty recent uh, that we've lost this ability, a uh, pretty recent event in evolution. Generally in evolution, genome duplication uh, was playing a very important role. And we can see in our genome, we can see the um, traces of past uh, paleoploidy events that took place uh, hundreds of million, millions of years ago in our ancestors. But later, because of regulation, now we cannot use this anymore, but other species can. But we won't talk much about this. Uh, anyway, it's also some sort of uh, redundancy. OK, uh, do you have any questions about what I have said right now? Or we can move forward. Okay, let's let's move on. 
So repetitive elements, uh, it's very, very general information. And you probably know about it, that when we think about repetitive elements of eukaryotic genomes, uh, there are many ways of classification of those, and people are still struggling to, um, to classify them, uh, to, to do very good classification. And there is no no such a thing as a really good classification of repetitive elements. Nevertheless, uh, some of them are tandemly arranged uh, head to tail, and uh, some of them are dispersed uh, repeats, and um, they include uh, mobile elements and the viruses and so on. And uh, you know that uh, sometimes you've heard also such terms. Also, th this is really quite confusing. Like you probably have heard the term satellite DNA and satellite DNA is something to do with method, how they were isolated. Probably Olga will tell you about this. But uh, actually also min mini satellites, micro satellites and macro satellites, they are distinguished according to the unit, which is repeated many, many times. And this is also very, uh, broad definition and of course uh, satellite DNA may consist of mini satellites or micro satellites and macro satellites and different scientists they they may confuse these terms so please be kind and don't try to blame them because this is what we have N nobody uh, has written any encyclopedia to to write that let's define this and let's agree on that so still many people have different ways how to call them uh, anyway we know that uh, these uh, elements are very common uh, and um, this is a very variable fraction of our variable fraction of our genome and around 1% of our genome consists of uh, short repeats and they are very variable and this variability is responsible for gene expression and so on and um, uh, repetitive elements are found not only in non-coding uh, regions. The, now there are some uh, studies that show that re repeated regions could also be found in coding um, sequences. This is also very interesting. Of course, they, they won't be very long, but you probably uh, heard about some, some of those repetitive repeats in proteins that cause some sort of diseases because they are also very unstable and they also bring to some sort of uh, different kinds of diseases. And um, tandemly arranged sequences, they tend to expand to other chromosomes uh, and within the genome. And uh, why it happens because of um, a slippage during uh, replication, probably Olga also will tell you about this in more detail. I will just uh, tell you that it it may be the reason, and also it can be a wrong reparation when a homologous recombination is involved. And after appearance of, uh, of this um, tandemly arranged repeats, uh, we can observe in the evolution such phenomenon as homogenization or concerted evolution. It's uh, some sort of evolution of repetitive elements when, for example, mutation um, appears uh, arises in one of the element and then uh, step by step it spreads through all other elements and there are also uh, some reasons for that it's homologous recombination and we can observe this uh, events both in pro and eukaryotic organisms uh, and uh, the unit of the repetitive uh, tandemly arranged uh, re repeats may, may be different and uh, we can observe also the evolutionary tendency for the unit reduction or uh, unit expansion and we shouldn't confuse this term with um, expansion of the number of repeats this also when you read these articles about repetitive elements there is always a confusion some people think that this amplification of uh, repetitive elements uh, and uh, actually they can mean that the the unit become twice as big uh, although not, not the number of, sequ of sequences so we should be careful when we use these words in different articles because there is no uh, proper way how to uh, organize it yet um, 
and um, just several words about mobile elements. Uh, these elements may also be arranged more uh, or less uh, together in the same blocks, but mostly they are dispersed through the genome and they can change their location within the genome. Uh, and uh, now it's clear that they can be divided into several classes, including DNA transposons. It's important which genes are used here. For example, for DNA transposons, the transposase gene is very uh, important. It's a protein transposase, which uh, cuts out the repeat and it inserts it in, into a new place. So actually it's kind of uh, can't cut and paste, not copy and paste as in um, other, other type of repetitive elements. Uh, and um, I, I won't tell you much because Olga will probably say about this. And we just need to also remember that there are some autonomous and not autonomous elements. Because recently, for example, I, I heard many uh, people say that these repetitive elements, which constitute our genome, they direct so many aspects of our biology because people believe that they are all actually active repetitive elements, but actually not because like mostly our genome is a cemetery, cemetery of dead mobile elements. They are not active anymore. Only very few of them are really active and transcribed. Most of them have got some mutations. They may, may lost some a part of genes or they may have lost some um, flanking repeats, which are important for relocation within the genome. And therefore they represent um, some relics of, of active elements. Um, and um, it's important also to uh, think that after mobile element uh, is uh, moving from the region on the chromosome, uh, there are some breaks, double-stranded breaks, which arise, and there are different ways how to heal them. Okay, anyway, I won't, I won't tell you much about repetitive elements. It's all for Olga. Just to mention that the first class elements, they use reverse transcriptase. So it means it's um, copy and paste fragments because it's RNA and RNA can be transcribed many times from the gene. And this RNA uh, forms new DNA and inserts into different parts of the gene. So here uh, in, of the genome. So here it's, we can understand how they propagate, how they propagate within the genome. As with the second class elements, they also may increase their number, but this uh, occurs through other ways which we'll Olga mention. We also need to say that um, different retroviruses are related to each other and they are related to um, so-called uh, LTR containing elements uh, in our genome. And uh, if we will consider uh, a typical retroviral element and remove the nth uh, protein, which is responsible for the envelope of the virus. So what we've got is a um, genomic element which can um, persist uh, in the genome. But the most important thing that it should be in the germline um, genome because if uh, you infect with virus just a somatic cell, it might never enter the genome which will survive in next generation. And as we remember, and you probably also read about this entrance of the second group, uh, which are important because um, they encode RNA, which demonstrates autocatalytic activity and introns and splicing of um, introns of eukaryotic genes have probably evolved from this particular introns. So why, uh, what happens when mobile elements insert to different parts of our genome? and what is significance of this insertion in evolution. So actually it's a very important factor of a higher eukaryote uh, evolution. Around 80% of mutations in high eukaryotes are due to uh, mobile element insertions. And um, we can see changes on the level of gene structure because exons or introns or promoters may change, maybe some regulatory 
sequences that are brought uh, and change the gene expression. Uh, and uh, what is now very important and uh, very big emphasis in the recent literature is uh, that uh, mobile elements may bring new regulatory elements such as enhancers and insulators and in such a way um, they can also change the activity of um, many genes so the gene itself uh, retains itself but the activity changes due to these new elements and of course they cause chromosomal rearrangements they cause deletions duplications inversions uh, and um, another issue is horizontal transfer because we can imagine that mobile element may move the genome and move the organism and enter environment and other organism may absorb it and it may be inserted into a different species and this is what we call horizontal transfer but we should we must remember that most of these insertions have no effect and only very very few that really have any adverse or maybe positive effect as well. Uh, here I just list several of diseases which are definitely caused by uh, insertion of mobile elements in human. Human is the most studied species so far and uh, we described so many diseases very carefully and these diseases are called, caused by mobile element insertion. Uh, can uh, transposons be uh, useful? And we did find some evidences that uh, this is really the case. Uh, for example, line elements are very important in reparation of double-stranded breaks in um, drosophila or telomeres or drosophila are also, uh, as you know, that there is no real uh, telomerase and telomeric tandem rearranged repeats. Um, I didn't tell you about this. I hope also you have some lecture about eukaryote genome uh, anatomy. And as you know, that most eukaryote species have tendently arranged repeats at the ends of chromosomes. Uh, but uh, in Drosophila, it is not the case. There is no telomeric repeats, no telomerase. Drosophila has uh, some little bit changed or as we say domesticated line elements that serve as um, uh, telomeric repeats to, to maintain the uh, length of the chromosomal length uh, because as you know during DNA replication of linear DNAs uh, we always have to have something to maintain the ends because otherwise they will be also they will get shorter because um, because DNA polymerase has tendency to work only in one direction. Uh, another example of domesticated transposon is the enzyme which is responsible for uh, immunoglobulin, immunoglobulin gene rearrangement and it's related to transposase. So obviously it was also derived from, uh, from transposons. And pretty recent domestication we can observe in our, in mammalian lineage and the formation of placenta uh, um, was also only possible. So this like huge evolutionary step, like we, we could get rid of amniotic egg. We could, um, we should uh, develop something to maintain the embryo inside, uh, inside the female body. And um, this placenta was also formed by, um, by means of genes which were derived from uh, transposons, from domestication of Altier uh, retrotransposons. So here I give you some uh, reference to the articles. You can, if you are interested, you can read more about it. Uh, I, will, I will give you references later, but you can just um, later check and find these articles. Most of them are op openly available. If you cannot open it, I can send it later to you. Uh, and um, this was about retrotransposons, but about DNA transposons, they, this uh, constituted around 3% of human genome. And at the moment, they're not active anymore, but some four, 40 million years 
ago, they were pretty active in primates and uh, amplified themselves. And um, generally in human population, uh, we can see that transposition rate is around one new insertion per 20 newborns. So this is pretty high rate of uh, transposon insertions. And um, SVA elements, they are less, little bit less active. It's just one new insertion per 900 newborns. Uh, in somatic cells, um, these insertions may also happen and they may have different consequences from uh, malignancies to a probable role in brain development. Now there's uh, some theories say that uh, due to repetitive element activity we have such a big diversity of uh, brain, brain cells. Um, so what happens uh, when we consider this activity of mobile elements? First of all, our genome is still growing. It's getting bigger and bigger. We can observe um, inter diversity within population, var variability uh, in insertions uh, in different parts of the genome. And of course, we can observe mutagenesis uh, and these inserts can be both into coding and uh, regulatory um, regions. Besides, uh, just because they are similar to each other, these elements, they also predispose these parts of the genomes for deletions, duplications, and inversions, even if they are not active, but they just share homology. This is enough for uh, homologous recombination system to, to make mistakes and to process this illegitimate recombination. When it happens in meiosis, we have all these multiple chromosomal uh, rearrangements. And of course, one of the reasons why the segmental duplications are formed. Besides, there may be some new genes, new exons, and new splice variants. Uh, Let's consider some new genes which appear because of mobile elements. Uh, for example, in primates, um, it was shown that um, SVA elements were really active in amplification in um, AMAC gene. Uh, and um, sometimes also even retro genes may be uh, important information of new genes because for, for a very long time it was considered when, for example, we have a retro gene, we've lost all the introns, we have just exons, and this retro gene is inserted. It's some sort of fake gene because it cannot do anything without introns. But actually, recently it was shown that there is a big list of genes that uh, appear it because of retro transposition. Um, when this uh, transposition effects uh, arise, usually they're very rare, but in some conditions, their number may raise uh, very fast. And these are mutation of some genes that control, that regulate the repetitive elements. These are environmental changes and environmental effects, and sometimes hybridization. For example, I told you about this hybridization of rhinoceroses, but if we have interspecific hybridization, very often we, we see that because these elements are not uh, adjusted to each other, then uh, th there is a dysregulation in their number and then it may grow, they may start to grow. And sometimes we can see that heterochromatic region really grow in hybrids because of hybridization. Um, this is a very controversial topic about horizontal transfer because some people believe that horizontal transfer is really extremely rare event. It may only happen because you should assume that DNA uh, somehow is retained in environment and then it absorbed by cell. But this is difference with prokaryotic cell. As we remember for prokaryotes, it's very important to, to swallow something new, new DNA, insert it and try to use it. Uh, so horizontal transfer is really common in bacteria. But 
uh, in eukaryotes, this way was almost possibly excluded. That's why it occurs really rare. And in many cases, when there were some articles, when they demonstrated that it was a horizontal transfer, later it was checked many times and people found that it was horizontal transfer between tubes in the laboratory. So we need to make really good bioinformatic analysis to analyze the inserts and to bring enough evidence that it was a real horizontal transfer. And nevertheless, nowadays we see many cases of such events. And um, of course, if we imagine the second class elements, it sounds easier because you have DNA, DNA with a protein, and it can uh, be inserted into another genome. Uh, everything looks fine, but even retro elements, which should have um, RNA uh, mediate intermediate molecule, which is not stable in the environment, it's RNA, it's not stable whatsoever, but nevertheless, it may also survive and it may also enter um, the new organism and integrate into germline cell. Uh, so this does happen and it also happens between prokaryote and eukaryotes. Look this article by Gilbert and Cordox, they shown that it was, it's also possible that prokaryote transposable elements may be inserted into eukaryote genome. So what to do if we don't have any protection, our genome will be totally dysregulated by mobile element because of course, even if they are not selfish, they may might become selfish and might become uh, viral. So what to do um, different um, organisms have developed different strategies just to keep those element at very low level of uh, activity as much as possible. Uh, for example, in plants, there is an RNA directed methylation of DNA in repeats. In Drosophila, there is also some epigenomic modification of uh, repeats in germ germline cells. Another important way is RNA interference. Probably you also heard about this uh, I, I won't tell you much about this phenomenon, you probably heard it. And um, I will um, stay more closely on physical removal, on the diminution, because this is really interesting, because you really need some to have some very sophisticated mechanism to remove DNA from your genome. So this is some slides about DNA RNA interference, I won't tell you much, so you can, you will have it on other courses, definitely. Uh, for me, it's like very interesting that how this system evolved in eukaryotes and this is actually from, from Kunin and this is his idea that this system uh, has three, um, uh, three ways of origin. So it, it came from eubacterial, archaeal and viral uh, organisms and they, they were combined in a sophisticated way and now it's a system without which we wouldn't survive with all these repetitive elements. So what I will tell you more and probably you won't have it on other courses, it's something about fungi. You know that fungi are very important or fungi some people say so there are different ways of pronunciation, let me call them fungi. Um, uh, this uh, organisms are very important because they always have small genomes. So genomes grow in animals, genomes uh, of eukaryotic organisms grow in plants. But if you go and pick up mushrooms or if you have some uh, mildew to analyze, we, you will see that the genomes are not so big. Why uh, is that? Because of biological uh, reasons. Uh, usually the fungi genome has very, very few repetitive elements. Um, first of all, because they need to grow fast, so they, they don't have this luxury to grow slowly and develop, so they, they really need to be fast, so it's one of the reasons. And the second is this uh, septs between the, as you remember, if you remember the structure, the morphological structure of the fungi, they need to do nuclei must travel from cell to cell, must be able to enter through pores. And if these uh, nuclei are large enough, this will be protected, uh, th this will be stopped 
That's why they have no ability to uh, grow. That's why all ways of um, uh, all mechanisms of their evolution are directed towards minimization of genomes, almost like in viruses. But these are not viruses. These are eukaryotic, eukaryotic organisms. But their biology demands you should have small genome. Uh, and interesting that this um, fungi now it was shown first it was described in Eurospore but later it was shown in many other uh, fungi that they developed such a strange mechanism which is called RIP uh, directed uh, repeat induced point mutation actually it was described pretty long time ago as you can see back to 19 1990s or end of last century, uh, it was shown that uh, in neurospora there are some mechanisms that really can destroy any repetitive elements. So you cannot have any repeated part of your genome. As soon as the system finds two similar sequences, it will destroy one of them. So how it happens? Uh, first of all, uh, this system works only in haploid nuclei, because if you have a diploid nuclei, you have your sequence will be continued somewhere else. So that's why another copy will be destroyed. That's why you cannot, you cannot do it in diploid nuclei. You have to do it in haploid nuclei. Everything should be, every sequence should be unique. This is um, the main idea of the, of the process. Uh, so this system uh, somehow checks DNA and it finds from like we, when we run BLAST, the same uh, the system does. It checks different sequences and it finds homology. As soon as it finds any homology, more than 400 uh, base pairs, doesn't matter if they're transcribed or not. They just need to be homologous. Doesn't matter if they're close to each other or, the, or they're located far away from each other. And that doesn't matter how these sequences are originated. Anyway, as soon as the system finds the duplication, it mutates cytosines in both uh, chains of every uh, DNA. Uh, and sometimes uh, the system may be spread to uh, adjacent areas. Uh, and if meiotic system if we, for example, have a mutant that have, chain, uh, have mutated meiosis, uh, nevertheless, this system is not affected, which means this is independent from meiosis. So we could assume that probably this is some, something similar to meiosis, because as we remember, during meiosis, we need two homologous chromosomes. They should find each other. So this is some mechanism how to find two homologous sequences and bring them together. Here, it is totally different, very similar goal to find homologous sequences, but the molecular uh, basis is totally different. The enzymes are totally different. So this system uh, was discovered in different uh, big uh, groups of mushrooms, which means it, it has appeared very early in fungi evolution. And there is a very interesting hypothesis about this system. So maybe you will think that now I'm totally crazy, but this is something I read in the article. So people believe that um, in this molecular mechanism uh, of this uh, recognition of homologous sequences, um, the reason is homologo homology of double-stranded DNA. As you remember meiosis or homologous recombination, we always make single-stranded DNA and then we check with the single-stranded DNA, we check uh, all other parts of the genome <clears throat> and we find homology. And this system here, it compares two double-stranded DNAs, first and second. Somehow it checks without, um, without melting, without getting single <clears throat> strand, somehow it checks two sequences, double-stranded DNAs and finds homology. How it happens, nobody knows. And this uh, must be very interesting biochemical question. <coughs> and as far as I know, now in France, they've got some grants to study molecular mechanisms um, and details of this process. And probably we can use them somehow in technology because this is something really new. I, I cannot understand how it works. Maybe you have any ideas? I don't. 
So because, but also there are some ways how these interactions between double-stranded DNAs uh, happen and maybe um, these interactions between double-stranded DNAs uh, are more broad and they somehow um, occur in many other phenomena like heterochromatin silencing. It's still the area we didn't know much. Okay, I think now we can we can make a very small break and discuss something we learned and ask some questions. Let me just find. No, I cannot find the chat. No, I did. Okay. Uh, evolution adaptability, very good. Yes, can please make clear how lines help with DNA reparation? Oh, it's a great question. So um, uh, when we have double-stranded breaks, the line elements may heal those breaks. For, because uh, as you remember, when, we, when there is a function in the eukaryotic cell, if we have a double-stranded break, the system of organism may um, recognize it and it may start to destroy DNA because it may think that it's something external and it's something the system doesn't like. And lines, they might heal it and they produce some sort of ends and they protect it from degradation. As we remember that telomeric ends of chromosome, they're very specific because um, the, there is a T loop and specific sheltering, we call them sheltering proteins that envelop uh, the telomeric ends of chromosome. That's why our system don't recognize them as um, double-stranded breaks. But as soon as real double-stranded breaks appear, we need to heal them somehow. And it's one of mechanisms how they can be healed when line elements participate. So do you have any other questions? Are you interested in fungi now? I'm, after after I read all this, I became really so much interested in FIGA. And now I think that we really need to classify them and analyze their biochemistry. And because there is a one um, model organism, as you remember, neurospore. Neurospore is a typical um, fungi organism, model organism, which is studied very, very well. And yeast, of course. I had uh, one one question about physical removing of mobile elements. You say that um, it, it, the organism should have very complicated system to do it, but what is the um, in general machinery of physical removing? Because I know that um, there were, were some um, studies um, where. Um, people removed uh, mobile genetics elements from bacteria to um, and thus make them more genomic stable, but it is more biotechnological process. And as I remember, it was uh, conducted, it was carried uh, out uh, using CRISPR-Cas, um, but maybe I'm now I'm wrong because it was quite long ago, but I'm interesting, interested in such type in, as I understand, in plants and in life. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, thank you very much for your question. I think later we will talk about this physical removing, but it will be physical removing of the big genome parts. And there we will discuss how it happens. But what is important, I really like your question because um, when we remember, for, for example, for ourselves, we don't want mobile elements to be active because they won't help us. All they do for us is just destroying us. So all we want to do just to silence them. They may be very useful for evolution because we, our um, children may domesticate them, but we, we don't need them in our genome. That's why if it would be some ways how to suppress mobile elements, we better prefer this. Um, but the problem is that, uh, and the good news is that most of them, they actually, they are not active. There are very few of them which are active and which really can lead to malignancy and so on. And we will find, if we will find these active genes and 
uh, remove them, it will be uh, really straightforward for our health because we will reduce the risks. But of course, it should be done in uh, germline cells and um, not, not on organism level. It, it would be too hard. But it's a really <clears throat> good point, and it's very good that people are working on, on this. And we will later talk about this physical um, uh, removing of uh, repetitive element pro and program program elimination of those elements from our genome. This will be our next point. So thank you that you, you asked this question. Let's let me show. So see this uh, part is called that uh, of the lecture that program elimination of genomic parts. So it's really program. It's not that happens by chance because all, of course by chance we can lose some part of genomes which are not necessary. If something was lost, it can be lost by, by chance. But this is something uh, really there is a program for this and like some enzymes that are responsible only for this to, to make the genome smaller. Uh, and um, this also contradicts to our basic principles. Usually we think that um, all organisms are result of cell div mitotic divisions of the same cell of uh, fertilized egg cell and that's why they all have more or less similar genomes. But it's not the fact because uh, as when we see to some tissues, for example, remember about er erythrocytes, they've lost the nucleus completely. They don't need them. So there is a way how to get rid of the genome. And this is a molecular way. So there are some hidden um, mechanisms in our cells that we can really get rid of the whole nuclei, uh, nuclei if, if we want. Or for example, uh, in some uh, tissues, there can be recombination, like in immune cell cells. That's why if we take this immune, um, cells of the immune system and try to sequence them, we see that the genome is not identical to those in fibroblasts or in other tissues. Um, and in we, here we will de discuss uh, the questions when this removal of some part of genome is very important developmental process, is, very, is integrated into developmental program of the organisms. And uh, very often it happens during the transition from germ germline cells into somatic cells. So usually germline cells retain all the repetitive elements. For some reason, they need them. They need this accumulated knowledge, this uh, additional stuff. And uh, somatic cells, they don't need them anyway. They will just fulfill their mission and die. That's why they don't need to have them. Uh, the, the less repetitive elements will have somatic cells, the better will leave the organism. And let's see how it happens. Let's start with the erythrocyte first. We all have this. We have this elimination. Our erythrocytes don't have any nuclei. And here, look, this is a picture of uh, bird uh, erythrocytes and mammalian erythrocytes. We cannot find any nuclei. Why? There are two theories. First, uh, the cell become smaller and it can go better through the capillaries. Um, and as we know that erythrocytes contain hemoglobin and they need to um, transfer oxygen and CO2 in our organism. Uh, and the second theory is that erythrocytes without nuclei, they can, they are more stable to anoxygenic conditions. So they are less sensitive to uh, to high um, level of glucose. Anyway, it happens. And we can see, for example, this uh, in three species. For example, we know that birds have uh, erythrocytes, reptiles have nuclei in their erythrocytes, and just mammals have lost them. But actually, in amphibians, it happened independently. Let's consider this genus of salamanders. It's called Batrahoseps. And there are three species. Uh, the same genus, three different species. In one species, here it's A, uh, only 1% of nuclei is removed. You see, it's almost like in birds, very big um, erythrocytes and the nuclei inside. Uh, in a different species, 
um, cavia, 50% of erythrocytes have removed their uh, nuclei. And in the third species, attenuatus, 99%, almost like in mammals, 99% uh, of uh, erythrocytes have lost their nuclei. So it means that generally this predisposition for uh, nuclear loss is somehow uh, within the program and it may be realized in different groups. We can see that it happened in all mammals and it has happened in some uh, amphibians at least as well. Maybe if, when we will study more and more different species, we will see that this is not so such, uh, such an exception maybe. Uh, it has happened many times in different organisms. But this is only for erythrocytes. In some groups of organisms, part of their um, genome is eliminated through in somatic cells. And uh, this process was called chromatin diminution and it was described back in 19th century. This is a discovery that, that is already uh, more than 100 uh, 20 years old, 130 uh, years old. Uh, so first it was described in 19th century in roundworms, and then later it was shown, it was demonstrated that reduction of the genome, genome happens not only in roundworms, but also in insects, in arachnids, in crustaceans, um, and in our uh, relatives in um, vertebrates, uh, for example, e even in mammals, but in mammals, it's just one chromosome may be lost. I will tell you more about this topic. Uh, more interesting that more recent discovery is that hogfishes and lampreys, which are pretty base in the evolution of vertebrates, they also have this um, chromatin diminution very, very common as a very common process. So as we see, it's not general, it's not characteristic, but maybe, my question is, maybe we all have them, but not in such a huge um, scale. Maybe we have a little bit of removal, who knows, on our stage when we develop from zygote to uh, somatic cells, maybe we do lose a little bit of our repetitive elements. It's a very big question and some people do think about it now because now we just started to do single cell genomics and we just started to think about it. But when we analyzed, when I used to work in Germany, we analyzed some uh, repetitive elements. We tried to establish if this rearranged chromosome comes from mother or from, from the father. And we checked the size of these um, heterochromatic blocks suddenly we found that the situation is that we are all mosaics and somehow the block reduces itself during development. And this reduction was um, during the transition from zygote to soma. This was uh, from, from germline cells to soma. This was really interesting discovery and maybe it generalizes somehow this, what happens uh, more obviously in other organisms. Okay, let's, um, talk more about diminution. First of all, diminution was described in uh, uh, different organisms. And in some cases, it's just some part of genome, which are, for example, there is a huge chromosome and some mechanisms that they cut out repetitive elements and remove them or blocks of repetitive elements. This is the first way. And the second way is um, the removal of um, of whole chromosomes, it also happens. And in some, species, in some species, it's not parts of chromosomes, but like uh, whole chromosomes are removed. And it seems that in different lineages, uh, this chromatin elimination um, has different origin. Okay, uh, let's start with chromatin diminution in um, roundworms. Uh, back in 19th century, there was a famous German scientist. His name is Theodore Bovary. And uh, he had this very nice drawings. You can imagine he used this uh, microscopes of uh, Carl Zeiss developed in Germany. And he observed the development of uh, parasitic roundworms 
and discovered it. It's, it was easy because there is only two chromosomes. You can see that he could observe that there are two chromosomes after the zygote formation. So it's just two blastomeres. And in one blastomere, the chromosomes, they retain their morphology. So they were big and they remain big. But in the second cell, something strange happens. The chromosomes start to disintegrate and there's some sort of split into tiny pieces. And these two big parts, the telomeric parts, they are getting removed from the cell and small parts they retain in the cells. And this cell will become the soma cell. And the cell which has retained the original size of chromosomes will become uh, the germline cell. That's why they will be never lost. In germline cell, they will be huge. These chromosomes containing huge number of repetitive elements. But in somatic cells, these are removed and only tiny chromosomes, not two anymore, are very many as you can see here, chromosomes um, are left. And um, with much less amount uh, of repetitive DNA. So later, this, the same process was discovered in 12 parasitic uh, species of uh, nematodes. Uh, and uh, recently, there were some new discoveries about it using um, new technologies, and it was demonstrated. So it was before, before DNA was, uh, double-stranded DNA was discovered. It's before the role of DNA was completely shown. Um, the diminution of chromatin has already been described. So recently it was shown that it, it is the heterochromatic blocks that are removed and the central euchromatic part is retained and uh, it's um, separated between 60 elements. Um, and that this removal happens during the first um, divisions of the zygote. And up to 90% of the genome uh, is eliminated in such a way. And of course, it's mostly repetitive elements. And recently it was shown that this uh, breaks uh, occur not randomly. They occur in the specific sites, which are called CBRs, chromosome breakage regions. Um, and uh, all this mechanism uh, is directed uh, in a very sophisticated way. But uh, if, you, if you're interested, I, I can send you some recent articles about it. Um, and of course, the systems of um, domesticated transposons are involved here because it should be DNA transposon because we need to cut DNA here. So that's why the repeats of the first time are not helpful here through through retrotransposition. So we need enzymes from the transposomes of the second type. So they are domesticated here and they participate uh, in the process. But generally, this is very poorly studied. So if you are interested, this is a very uh, interesting topic and very few people are actually interested and in study this. I really urge you interest if you would like to join some laboratories to do it. Uh, which is more, a little bit better described, is diminution of chromatin in infusoria, uh, in protozoan uh, organism, where uh, the macronucleus, uh, where the genome, as you remember, is um, uh, divided into macronucleus, and micronucleus. And micronucleus is a generative nucleus and uh, macronucleus is just a, a somatic uh, nucleus. Um, I don't think I will, I will tell you much about, about this process. You can, um, you can find more about it in the article. But the main thing is that the macronucleus uh, it's like nucleus which we have in our liver or in our uh, skin or in our fibroblast. So it's nucleus which will be destroyed. It will, it will not go through generations. But the uh, micronucleus, this is something which, which will go through generations. And that's why we, we see that this macronucleus will be totally destroyed. 
uh, during the process of sexual reproduction, complicated sexual reproduction. And macronucleus, macronuclear genome, it will give rise to the macronucleus. And for us is now important. So if you're interested to, to learn about it more, I will, I will send you the articles. It's really interesting. But for now, it's important that during this uh, process of macronucleus generation, um, the process of repetitive element elimination takes place. Uh, during this process, uh, some chromosomes are getting removed or some parts of chromosomes are getting physically removed. Some part of chromosomes are getting polytenized, like in polytene chromosomes of Drosophila, but they, they, uh, there are many fragments here, more than 10,000 fragments. So these polytene chromosomes are cut into very many fragments and unnecessary part are removed and only from two to 4% of genome is retained and it's uh, it initiate the, this macronucleus, which is like polyploidized many times, this kind of uh, bag full of genes. Uh, and interesting that it, each gene also retains telomeric sequences uh, at the ends. And uh, this fragment is around from two to three uh, hundred thousand base pairs. Uh, and uh, what is interesting to us, the molecular mechanism, which are behind this process. And it seems that again, domesticated transposons, DNA transposons and PVRNA uh, are important uh, molecular mechanisms to, to make this process. Uh, because uh, first of all, you need to to cut the genome here, but to recognize this particular place, you the RNA mediated uh, process is used. That's why transposase is needed to cut the DNA and PVRNA to recognize particular sequence. We see that composition of different processes is very important. Um, and it's also, it's not very well studied. So um, it's really interesting group and a really interesting process and molecular mechanisms are still largely unclear uh, how it all happens. Uh, let's move on and talk about other groups. Um, diminution of chromatin was described also in Cyclops, it's crustaceans and the phenomenon itself was described back in 60s, almost 50 years ago, more than 50 years ago actually. And today it's very well described in Cyclops in more than 20 species. Uh, and it also happens very early on the fourth cleavage stage. And the number of chromosomes is, is usually not changed. So there are no, no chromosome elimination. Usually what is eliminated is parts of chromosomes, around 90%. And these, these are eliminated in uh, some sort of granules. So really big granules are uh, separated and uh, eliminated from, uh, from the genome. And you can observe it very well cytologically. If you will take this development, developing X of the, uh, of the cy cyclope, you can see this process of uh, diminution really well and formation of this uh, very interesting granules. Okay, let's move on and talk about um, diptera insects. Uh, in this uh, species, uh, the species is called Searacopophila. So this, this is species related to flies more or less. And here, um, as we know that polyploidy doesn't uh, happen in flies and generally in insects, they, they do have some, some games with ploidy, like we know in ants and in bees but generally polyploidy is not this major kind of evolutionary trend in this group. Uh, but um, in this particular species, the elimination of chromosomes was detected 
and uh, it was very well described. And these chromosomes were described as L chromosomes because they are limited chromosomes, limited to the germ line. That's why they were called L chromosomes. And interesting that during the process, not only this heterochromatin rich L chromosome is eliminated, but also, also the paternal X chromosome. And it was demonstrated that during this elimination, a very important role, very important role is taken by um, epigenetic modification of the genome. So let's go, uh, let's check our um, relatives, our um, vertebrate relatives in lampreys uh, and um, hackfishes. Uh, in eight species of hackfish, uh, the elimination of huge chromosomes was described or their parts and uh, as in other species also mostly heterochromatin is eliminated and from 20 to 50 percent and it seems that this process is not really well regulated and in some cases we can see that more of repetitive elements as is still retained in other um, tissues less and that's why the species is very complicated for genome assembly and analysis. And the same with species which we know very well, the lamprey, probably you have tried this. Uh, I remember when I needed the lamprey, I went to St. Petersburg and I, because you can buy them uh, on the market uh, in October. Uh, and um, in this species also uh, programmed um, elimination of, uh, of chromatin was described and interesting that um, gene sequences homologous to ribosomal RNA are also getting eliminated and different groups now are working on this and recently it was work by Vladimir Timoshevsky uh, where he has demonstrated that um, uh, repetitive elements um, by themselves are very important in directing this process. Somehow they are recognized by, by some specific mechanisms and um, they may be responsible for elimination of particular genomic parts and sometimes whole chromosomes as well. So what we should learn from, this, from these two groups, from hackfishes and lampreys, uh, remember that they are in the base of our vertebrate tree and maybe the fact that they uh, retain this mechanism, it may indicate that this mechanism is actually quite ancestral and maybe we still have it a little bit or our ancestors all had it and we just lost it more or less or we just retained it on a very small level. So that's why it's really interesting to see, for example, if I would plan an experiment, I would take the um, embryos of, of a model organism, maybe of a mouse, and uh, I would compare the germline cells and the developmental uh, cells of different tissues, trying to see if really such processes, processes are very common or not. And maybe we will, because it's all pretty recent and Usually, the problem is when we study genome, what we take usually? We take somatic cells. We take skin, we take liver, blood, fibroblast, anything which is really easy to work with. It's very rare when we check germline cells. And it's very, very rare when we take for genome sequences, sequencing germline cells of particular organism. That's why since we neglect the germline, we might also have neglected uh, so many important processes of uh, chromatin uh, diminution. And I think uh, pretty many discoveries are still forthcoming uh, in this. Okay, let's go to mammals now. Uh, diminution of chromatin was, no, it's not mammals, it's um, fish, it's a relative of shark and um, race. Um, back in 80s, it was described that the diminution of chromatin happens during spermatogenesis of the species. And I haven't heard anything since then in this group because generally um, sharks are not very well studied and the genomics of sharks is just started to, to develop. We, we need to, to learn more about this group. Uh, End of 20th century, 1998, uh, in zebra finch, 
uh, a chromosome was described also because people have described chromosomes of zebra finch back in 60s. Uh, but um, people never watched the meiosis. When people at the end of 20th century, by chance, started to, to investigate meiosis of this group, they found that there is a large chromosome, the largest chromosome uh, of the genome is totally eliminated from somatic cells. It present uh, present uh, presence only in germline cells, but not in any uh, somatic cells. And they first described as a B chromosome. They said it's unnecessary chromosome, which sometimes can be seen in, or regularly can be seen in um, or genesis and in spermatogenesis of, of this fish. And later it was shown it was demonstrated, so th these were three uh, recent articles uh, already in 20th century, 21st century. Uh, the chromosome was called GRC, germline restricted chromosome, and it was demonstrated that it's transferred only through oocytes, not through spermatogenesis, so it was, it's eliminated from the um, mature sperm. Uh, and it's eliminated from all somatic cells and it's the largest chromosome of the genome. And mostly this chromosome consists of repetitive element and it doesn't uh, code many uh, protein coding genes. Uh, but recently more and more articles were written about this. For example, this is a famous work by Alexander Such. So today, for example, I've got from him invitation to join the discussion uh, of this process. So they still actively working on this. There is a big uh, project um, studying this process and it was demonstrated that in pretty many songbirds not only in zebra finch but we haven't described it just because we didn't watch the meiosis as soon as people started to watch meiosis they found that this this is much more common that, than we thought it was found in almost uh, every uh, songbirds and in some in in zebra finch it was just very big it was it was very easy to detect but in some songbirds it's really small and since in birds the number of chromosomes is so high the cytology the cytogeneticist didn't dis, didn't describe ну все смерть а так интересно было Как делишки? Кажется, миграция в Бишкек не спасла его. За ним пришли. Если что, все еще запись идет. Что, блин? Да, запись идет. Ну что, Леш, запускай эту игру. Что он включил сейчас? Um, Леша, что за игра? Ну, Куда которая игра? поиск, поиск стран. А. а, ты мне говоришь? Конечно. Конюшня. А что случилось? У меня просто интернет прорвался, я ничего не поняла. Кажется, забрала с собой лекцию. У Володи отвалился интернет сейчас. Он, он даже в Телеграме не отвечает. А, все, сейчас чат подключается. Ну, зато перерыв. А кто все эти люди, которые вот участники... Там куча людей, которых я не знаю. Это у нас первокурсники? Или это просто куда-то ссылку расшарили? Они тебя слышат, если что. Да, да, это первокурсники. Она же была вообще друг. Нам сказали, приходите. Хайли рекоменду. Ну нет, хайли хайли. Это про Олега Гусеников. 
Ну и здесь тоже, конечно, хай. So high. Ну, значит, это первокурсники, которые не ходят в лабу, потому что я их не видела. А это Марго ходит. Сегодня сильно больше первокурсников в лабе. Я да потому первые... что я не пришла сегодня. Да. Ну да. Алеш, покажи первокурсников. Вот они. Полина, привет. Полина, привет. Мы это, если что, вырежем. Я про доступ спросил, доступ у нас будет к облаку, так что на YouTube все зальем. Можешь это сделать, да? Это я. Да, да, да. Ура! Но вырезать кто-нибудь другой будет, если хотите. Забейся. Кто больше наговорит, что захочет вырезать, тот и будет вырезать. Да, правильно. Может, на стоп нажмем? Марина, Марина, для тебя. Что, офицер? А можешь на фон Кыргызстан поставить? Ой, значит, ну, зеркалить надо. А. Вот, видите, сами боги послали нам сигнал, что я слишком много говорю. Это очень интересно. Uh, да, давайте подумаем, у нас есть еще время? У меня буквально пара слайдов, чтобы закончить. Да, у нас еще есть время. Все, давайте тогда сейчас быстренько-быстренько все заканчиваем и переходим к вопросам. Так, 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 так. Был небольшой перерыв. Uh -huh. uh, so can you see now the slide? Yes, yes. Uh, okay. Uh, So this is another group. It's also advertisement of Novosibirsk. So this is group by Pavel Borodin, and they also work with this chromosome. They demonstrated that there are so many songbirds that do have this germline restricted chromosome, and they're involved in the project. The last December, it was really, I enjoyed discussion because Alexander Such came from Sweden, and Paco came from South America, and we had really wonderful discussions about these chromosomes and this element, why it's so widespread in songbirds. And at the moment, Anna Torgashova and Lyubov Malinovskaya, they're working on this project. If you have any questions, I will give you their emails. They will be happy to tell you everything about this interesting uh, phenomenon. So now, uh, mammals, our relatives. Uh, Elimination of one chromosome one described in marsupial species in bandicoots, and later it was demonstrated then in uh, some walls also sex chromosome may be lost during development and somatic cells it was demonstrated the X chromosome is lost, and you will be surprised, but any of us is also not uh, insured against removal of chromosomes. And these are medical data. Look, look this graph. This is losing the Y chromosome in human somatic cells. So for example, if we, if we analyze a person who is around 40 something years old, around 3% of his cells will not have any Y chromosome. So this is a lot because Y chromosome is not necessary. It's only needed very early in, develop, in the development when we need to start the sexual differentiation. Later, the chromosome is only necessary for spermatogenesis. Uh, in other cells, for example, in skin cells, why do we need the Y? We don't need it. That's why it may be lost only in 2% of cells. But if we will analyze the 70% 70 years old person that up to 45% of cells may lack Y chromosome, which means that during the mitotic division, uh, when we don't need something, it may be lost really easily. The Y chromosome doesn't have any necessary genes for, for example, for fibroblast cells. So it may get lost. And this is something we observe not in the young person, but later when there are many more uh, divisions happened, then it's something we should expect. Also, we should expect this from tissue cultures. If we have something unnecessary in the tissue culture and do many divisions, it will be lost. 
so do you think it's only problem of people with Y chromosome? Not only this, in on even say even the X chromosome can be lost because the second X chromosome, as you remember, is inactivated uh, in female mammalian female cells and it forms a bar body. So the X chromosome, the second Y uh, inactivated uh, X chromosome may be also lost, but only um, in elderly women it was detected and only up to 5%. So this is not comparable to what happens with the poor Y chromosome that may be lost in 50% of cells. Nobody cares about the Y. Uh, the next, okay. Now I think it's time to say stop. So if you will have some other time, I will tell you more about the redundancy, genome redundancy on the level of segmental duplication and gene amplification of particular genes, but not today, because today we will need to digest what we have already got. So I'm ready to answer your questions. I have a question. Um about the redundancy and uh, diminution of the uh, chromosome, I have a question. Uh, why it started only in 40 year? year? Because it, uh, it don't need it uh, from five, I don't know, from the baby uh, age, but we have started to lose it only in 40. What's the reason? And I am trying to understand because uh, I know that it, it, it is a male um, organism, and usually um, male don't have any special changes uh, changes in, in uh, the future, but why it's happened? Mm -hmm. So what I, I showed you, it's just a medical description. So they just described it, something that happens. So they don't have any theory why it happened so late. I think it has something to do with the number of divisions and with the degree of how exactly this process happening. Because in young organism, usually the process of, meiosis, uh, of my, mitosis and even of meiosis in young organism is much more precise. But later, uh, because of, of aging process, this process is not so precise anymore. And I think it's uh, one of the reasons why. And maybe because when many divisions happen that some inevitable processes take place, and maybe it's something what we call cell aging is involved. But this is just my theory. I, I don't know the answer for this. Um, I also have a pool of questions, actually, if you, uh, nobody uh, doesn't, doesn't mind, uh, but the first is, um, is there some selected um, ascarids, for example, or uh, round forms in general, uh, which were how to say, uh, without the elimination of uh, repeat elements and could be it be artificially, I mean, uh, to do such organisms artificially um, without removing such huge parts of uh, the in initial genome. Well, it's a really interesting question. You know, generally about the roundworms, uh, they uh, actually it's a pretty big group of organisms, and most of them, especially the free living ones, um, don't have any. Uh, at least elimination hasn't been described. Maybe they do have some elimination, but in very small scale. We don't know. At, at least people didn't observe it. Uh, but in parasitic um, organisms, it was described very well. Uh, but also not in all of them. And I think it's a really good question because we, will, we can try to induce some mutation that affect the process. For example, if we will induce the mutation of uh, Ascaris and have a, a lineage that doesn't uh, go through the process of elimination, it's interesting if it will be viable or not. And it's really a good question. Maybe it will survive and we can compare the um, 
the lifestyle and uh, just to know because we still cannot say if it's a, an essential process or not maybe if somatic cells will retain all these repeats nothing bad happens because most of organisms do do not differ so much from the germline cells yes because of uh, this thought uh, this question um was accurate uh, so it's really interesting to understand that today it is it isn't known mm -hmm. no, no. also you know in birds also of course in zebra finch is the largest chromosome but for example in in swallows and some other birds some birds this eliminated chromosome is really tiny. The question, it doesn't affect the genome size. Why to remove it? Is it that toxic that we need to remove it in by any means? It's really big question. Yeah, because and generally, you know, mm -hmm. the birds, they have a small genome and the tendency is to reduce the genome. It's uh, pretty obvious, but the tiny chromosome and still it, it is eliminated. And um, probably the next my question is, to some extent, is connected with the previous. Uh, but um, am I right uh, uh, that um, this elimination um, is going only outside the German lines? So only German uh, lines, germ lines. Um, are stable in this context. Yes, differentiation. When differentiation happens, for example, cell division, and this remains the germline, and this one becomes the somatic cell. And if this one will be somatic cell, there will be this process of elimination. It's some sort of mark that something where the everything will be eliminated, it will become somatic. And the one where we retain everything will become the germline. There is some theories or hypothesis why they should uh, retain in germline. So could it um, help for stable genome? I, I don't know, or something like that. Is it useful for germ cells somehow, or it just happened? <laughs> mm -hmm. So there are many theories, but nobody has any evidence that it's somehow uh -huh. necessary for, I don't know, for meiosis or anything. So usually it has genes which are which look like selfish genes, this genes that help this chromosome to stay and not to get eliminated. Mm -hmm. So these are genes, protein coding genes, and they uh, promote some processes. And generally, I think the evolutionary idea behind this is to keep this diversity, to keep mm -hmm. this redundancy, but we don't need to keep it in the somatic cell because it will not go through generation. This redundancy is enough to be kept in, in germline cell, which, is, which are pretty small number. We don't invest so much in germline cells. <clears throat> It is not a question uh, now, but I now I am thinking that probably it is interesting to maybe um, observe. Uh, is there some dynamics of changing this uh, volume of uh, um, redundant components of germline's um, genome in generations? So maybe during generations, these uh, elements are also declined, the number of this, because it's look, it isn't, mm, they looks like they're not useful, but they are still there. So, but it is not a question, just, just thoughts. <laughs> Yes, yes, it's a question if they're selfish or not, or if they're useful. So as we see in somatic cells, so for example, the germline cells, they also undergo mitotic divisions mm -hmm. because it's not only meiosis. So also there are some meiotic division, uh, mitotic divisions of, of germline cells. And we can see that these elements are retained somehow. They are not eliminated. So we don't see any variation between them. They are pretty stable. Mm -hmm. They only start to get eliminated during this particular process, which means that this mechanism switches on uh, only during this particular, this program 
is inside the genome, but it doesn't work. It switches on only in particular period of life. Yeah, I, I understand. Mm -hmm. And also they should be stable in meiosis. But as we see in birds, for example, during meiosis, all male cells or so all sperms, they lose this chromosome. We can observe it in the meiosis when we do meiotic cells, myocytes, but when the uh, mature sperm is formed, it contains no uh, GRC chromosome. I also That's have- interesting. Uh, it's interesting. That it's all. <laughs> I also have a question. I know that uh, zebrafish genome was sequenced a long, a lo a long ago and uh, uh, di did anybody ever tried to look on this uh, chromosome that is illuminated? I, I mean, uh, it's very interesting what genes are located on it and uh, do and maybe repeats. If there is a lot of repeats on this chromosome, maybe they're also expressed and uh, influence their um, initial development or some, I don't know, processes uh, of in germ cells. I think it's very interesting and you you, you said uh, nothing about it. Mm -hmm. Yes, this is exactly what Alexander Suk's group is studying now. What they do, so this genome, it was genome of somatic cell and they sequence the somatic genome and the germline genome, which is not so easy because how to get germline cells? This is the question. For example, you get a chicken. How do you get the somatic cell? Uh, how do you get the germline cells? This is almost impossible. You need to get tissue, which because usually even when we've got germline, it's always surrounded by somatic cells. So what we have to do is single cell uh, sequencing, genome sequencing. This would only help to get the germline cell and sequence it. But they already did this analysis. So they took at least uh, gonads, which contain both germline and somatic cells and compared it to somatic cells. They found the differences and they also demonstrated these differences are due to these uh, genes located on this additional chromosome. What they found, there are many genes from different part of the genome, so it's not kind of evolved from chromosome one. No, it's evolved from the whole genome. Somehow different genes have invaded the chromosome and they are duplicated. So somehow these are not necessary genes uh, and not essential genes in a way they are duplicated copies. And also within the chromosome, some of them have many different copies. So they have multiple copies and they are protein coding and they expressed. So they found the differences and expression from these um, transcripts that carry mutation specific for this chromosome. And this chromosome is pretty old. It's uh, because it's for all songbirds. It means it have, has uh, originated only once around 50 to 60 million years ago. And, um, but the reason why it's it's the main reason why it exists and if it's useful or not still they cannot answer this question you can you can check their recent articles it's their main idea to try to uh, understand it and maybe this process is more general than we think for example who has ever uh, checked the meiotic cells of lizards or meiotic cells of uh, well platypus did somebody checked but nevertheless like if this cell is very imagine that this chromosome is tiny nobody would never notice it people noticed it because it was huge that's why um maria pigozzi has has found it in meiosis if it would be really tiny we would still think that there is no such a thing so if we imagine then if in human for example if there is a really tiny chromosome which is germline restricted Maybe it is the fact, we don't know. We never checked this. It may be tiny because all this tiny stuff we usually ignore when we do genome assembly and sequencing. Thank you. Thank you for your question.
Okay. Ah, okay, I can see that maybe something in chat. Uh, could you please share articles? Uh, yes, 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 yes. I can, I can do it. I can, I can send this uh, article to Avil probably, right? And. Oh yes, yes. You can and send me the articles and yes. the presentations in English. Uh -huh. <laughs> yes, and uh, I will share with uh, everyone. Yeah. This Zoom. Okay.